Hello, I'm Ryan Fang. I'm a student in Dr. Sager's previous class, and I'm also a volunteer on the student committee for Startup Week. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker here. He's the founder of, of Gastrograph, and this is an artificial intelligence platform that helps beverage and food producers. It's my pleasure to welcome Jason Cohen. Hi, everyone. So uh, I think a bunch of you have been through prior Startup Week events so far. And a lot of them, what I've seen, I, I was attended these when I was a student here at Penn State. Uh, I presented at one other uh, Startup Week. And so what we see a lot of is um, founders or CEOs or individuals from large companies coming and giving great advice, great recommendations. But a lot of it is really difficult to integrate and to use and to understand. Um, when you're just starting out. And so I wanted to make this uh, a bit more applied. And so we're actually going to do something much more like a workshop. Right? Because the problem is, oops, um, the problem is that half of all the advice that you get is wrong. Right? Um, so this comic is XKCD says, uh, never stop buying lottery tickets no matter what anyone tells you. Right? Failed again and again. Um, and the idea is that everyone is going to have survivorship bias. Anyone who's presenting, you know, this is what worked for me, this is what you should do, um, that's survivorship bias. And there's all of these beliefs in the startup world or in the startup community or that you'll find on startup blogs of you have to do these three things or you have to start uh, by doing these things or this is what makes good companies successful. Um, but a lot of that is untested, right? People do it because everyone does it and everyone does it because they read on some blog that that's what everyone does. Um, and so what we want to do is we want to start, take a step back and look at first principles. What are the things that are needed in order to, to make your company successful? And so um, take this either with a grain of salt or with a large mountain of salt, depending on what side of the line it, line, it, it lies on for you. But one of the, the problem is right, you don't know which half of the advice is, is right or wrong until much, much later. Um, so we'll present some things from first principles. I'll present some things from first principles. We're going to do this uh, workshop style. And um, you'll see how much of the advice you can take away. So, like I said, something completely different. The idea behind this presentation is that clear communication, the ability to communicate your ideas uh, at, at any stage of development is an advantage. It doesn't matter if you are one person or two people in a garage or in a dorm at uh, Penn State and you have no revenue, no customers, no employees. It doesn't matter if you have millions of dollars in funding and 50 employees. And it doesn't matter if you're a large global company. Right? You're going to be pitching and presenting and trying to clarify and communicate your ideas no matter what you do. And you're going to be doing it all the time. And anyone who has the ability to communicate more clearly and to make themselves more under, understood more easily is going to have that advantage. So statistics, right? The average startup fails. 99% of all startups, high growth technology startups, fail. Uh, that, that's a 1% success rate. And no one starts off believing like, oh, right, I, I have a 1% success rate. I didn't start this company at, at Penn State and say to myself, great, 99% right, probably fail, 1% probably succeed. Um, but rea realistically, right, um, it's there, you start off with a 1% success rate. And from there, there's things that you can do to raise that success rate. And so we believe that communication, we have a lot of evidence, that communication, clarifying your ideas, being able to present your ideas, is one of those things that if you improve, you'll have a much easier time of, of, uh, of succeeding. And once you succeed, the average startup takes about seven years to exit. Most of those exits, this is the 1% of startups that succeed, most of those exits are mergers and acquisitions, right? And about 50, 60% of those are sold basically at cost. So that returns approximately no money to investors, or just as much money as they put in. Right? The rest of the 50% go on to, to, to return some capital on investment, and maybe 1% of those actually go to something like an IPO, an initial public offering, right? or turn into a, a large standalone company. So it's an uphill battle from the beginning. Um, and if you, if you start a successful company, you need to start thinking about those seven years. Um, so not to pick on any companies in particular, but we've seen some companies. Um, one that existed when, when I was here at Penn State was called Lion Party Network. And it was a company that was supposed to help you find a Penn State party near you. Um, yeah, and I'm sure that that was an incredible amount of fun to start. And I'm sure those guys got invited to a lot more parties 
running Lion Party Network. But I can't imagine that you know, in three years or four years when they graduate, or five years, six years, seven years after they've been out of school, that they still want to be working on that, that they're still going to be attending Penn State parties. You think you're going to be attending Penn State parties four years after you graduate? No? Yeah. So when you pick one of these things to work on, you should be thinking about five-year and 10-year time horizons. Because if you're successful and you have customers and investors and employees, you have a responsibility to them to keep that operating, to return the money, to keep the, the company growing. That's why they invested in you. Right? So you should pick things that matter and you should pick things that you want to work on. And that's another thing that's going to increase your success rate. So once you've picked your idea, you've started your company, um, you're going to be talking about your company um, every day to everyone as long as it lives. And that's a pretty exhausting proposition. Right? You're going to be presenting this all the time. You're going to have to learn it so well that you can present it in your sleep, you can present it in 30 seconds, you can present it in three minutes, or you can present it in three hours. Right? You're going to have different meetings and different conversations that are going to last, those different lengths of time that you need to be able to effectively and clearly communicate why someone should join you, why someone should invest in you, why someone should use your technology versus a competitor's technology. And this is a difficult thing to do. And it starts off really, really hard. Right? And so the idea behind this workshop is you may as well get good at it. So um, first principles. Clarity of communication is clarity of thought is clarity of mind. If you can clearly communicate, it shows that you know what you're thinking of, and it shows that you've actually thought through all of its implications. Is that clear? Good. So good ideas can be like a virus. Right? They can take on a life of their own. You can tell them to people and they can spread. They can change behaviors. They can change industries. They can change technology. Uh, and a good example of that is Uber. So Uber has made the idea very clear and very easy that you should be able to get into any random stranger's car at a touch of a button and arrive where you want to go paying a fair flat rate. Right? Before Uber, that was a crazy idea. Hitchhiking was illegal in most of the United States. Right? Um, but Uber made that real. And they made that real by clearly communicating the value proposition. We're going to take you where you want to go using drivers who are already on the road, and we're going to do it mobily without a phone call, and we're going to do it cheaply. Right? Anyone tried to use taxis before Uber? You would call. They'd say it's a 20-minute wait. The taxi wouldn't show up. You had no idea what the price was going to be before you got in the taxi. The taxi would lie to you and tell you they don't accept American Express. Right? It was not a good experience. So that's what we mean, that an a good idea can be like a virus of the mind. So when you watch Steve Jobs communicate what a computer is, he didn't say, right, oh, a computer is 10 million transistors that can do complex mathematics faster than any human. Right? He didn't say that computers are a better typewriter. Right? What he said is computers are a bicycle for the mind. And he said that because he wanted to show that computers were augmenting human capabilities, that they weren't there to compete with humans or to take over jobs from humans, that computers were there to make humans more capable. And that's a really effective and clear way of communicating that, right? No one's scared of a bicycle. Most people like riding bicycles, at least not in Pennsylvania weather. But, uh, but that's the difference, right? Is that clear communication, that clear envisioning? Because then someone can easily respond, like, OK, well, who's going to use it? And he can say, everyone, right? Uh, so. There's an old saying, this used to be more popular, but an old saying, investment thesis saying, that um, optimal startup teams, right? You have a hacker, a designer, and a hustler. Uh, the, the hacker's going to build the software, the designer's going to make it uh, beautiful and easy to use, and the hustler is going to be the one who sells the idea. They're going to sell it to, uh, he's, they're going to talk about it, they're going to present it, they're going to get investment, they're going to get clients, they're going to get em recruit employees. But the thing that they don't tell you is that it's usually the hustler that becomes the CEO. Right? It's who's ever holding that idea, presenting that idea. It's who's ever pitching that idea that usually becomes the CEO. So if you're sitting there and you think that I want to become a CEO, I want to co-found a company, right? you think I could leave the communication bit to other people, I can leave the presentation to other people, I can leave the sales to the salespeople, right? then you're fooling yourself. That's not first principles. Because if you can't communicate it, then you're never going to hire a VP of, of comms or a VP of sales who can communicate it, and you're never going to talk other companies into using it. right? You have to be able to clearly and distinctly and uniquely communicate the value and the impact of what it is you're doing and why anyone should care. Because otherwise, no one's going to care. So um, first principles again. 
Whoever controls a conversation has the advantage in shaping what happens next. Is, is that clear? Right? If you can frame your arguments, if you can frame the questions that people are going to ask, if you can shift uh, your phrasing or your examples to match uh, what, what someone is going to be receptive of or what someone wants to discuss, right, then you can control the flow of the conversation. You can control whether that conversation is going to end in a sale or it's going to end in a rejection. You can control whether it's going to end in an investment uh, or it's going to end in a rejection. Right? You have to be able to shape the communication, shape the conversation, shape the points that you're going to be making. And that shows even further handle, right, an even better handle on the ideas and the concepts and the tools or the technology that you're building it, that you're working on. So this is not easy to do. Um, and when, when I first started analytical flavor systems, we definitely didn't get this right from the beginning. Right, so these are three rejection emails for investment um, from about three years ago. Um, Wesley Chan was at Google Ventures. John Lenahan was at Spark Capital. Um, I don't remember where Tim Devine was. I guess it wasn't an important investment fund. Uh, but these are three rejection letters. Right? And when you first start pitching, this is the surest sign that something's not working. Your communication is unclear. The value proposition is not clear. Um, whoever it is doesn't believe in, in what you're doing. Right? And that's fairly constructive negative feedback. Uh, that is harsh and impactful negative feedback. And you say, oh, it doesn't matter. They didn't get it. Right? Then you're deluding yourself. You, right? It's always because you did not communicate clearly enough, because you did not do something. Uh, you did not create something. You did not envision something that was unique and distinct and valuable enough. Or maybe you did, and you just didn't get the idea across. Right? So since then, we've raised um, well over half a million dollars. Uh, we, have, we work with some of the largest food and beverage companies in the world. Uh, I was just in uh, Indonesia, New Zealand, Tokyo, Shanghai, um, over in Q1 with multiple meetings in each one. Um, we had multi-day boardroom meetings uh, in, in New Zealand, resulting in, in one of our largest sales ever. Um, and that was two days worth of presenting to panels of 15 people who were the global directors of R&D of a company. Right? And I have to be able to, to stand there, sit there, stand there, converse with them, and be able to debate their points. They say, will this really work on our product? Will this really work in our industry? What proof do you have that this is going to work in our industry? It doesn't matter that it's worked in other industries, that it's worked in beer, that it's worked in coffee. How is it going to work with what we do? Right? And you have to be able to respond to that. You have to be able to do that um, confidently, competently, and you have to make it clear from the beginning. Because if you waver or if you uh, can't pull examples and believable arguments, then you're not going to make that sale. So um, here's, a, here's an example of that. Um, so I get asked who I am all the time, sometimes in business settings, sometimes casually. So if I'm standing at a bar and uh, a beautiful woman says, what do you do? I can say, I'm a professional taster. That's interesting. That's intriguing, right? That's true. I just say, what, what do you mean you're a professional taster? What do you taste, right? Oh, beer, coffee, wine, tea, spirits, scotch, right? Variety of things. Um, that's very interesting. That usually gets a conversation going. If someone asks me, right, what do you do, and I don't want to have the conversation, I could say something like, oh, I build machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms to model human sensory perception in food and beverage products. Right? That, that conversation usually stops uh, about there. <laughs> doesn't go much further. Uh, and so you can shape where that's going to go, right? That's kind of obvious. And so uh, you should start this now. So this is, um, I started the, the Tea Institute of Penn State, an interdisciplinary research institute dedicated to the study and preservation of all tea, tea ceremony, and tea culture. Um, this is the, the tea master of Taiwan. These are all of my former students. So uh, no one instinctively cares about tea, right? I didn't start at, go to the university and say, you know what we really need? Let's start a tea institute. And they were like, yes, absolutely. That's going to compete with the football team for funding and turnout, right? Um, who here has actually ever heard of the Tea Institute? Oh, cool, a couple people. That's awesome. Um, so this was not like an instinctively easy or interesting thing. The university was not initially of this, right? Um, so what did we do? We, we just operated so well that they couldn't ignore us. We got funding. We flew in the, the Tea Master of Taiwan. We flew in the Ambassador of Taiwan. Uh, to the United States, and we told the university, well, look, you know, these people are coming. You should really be, you should really be here with us, right? And then the university showed up. Um, and that's the way they did it by trying to talk the university into it first. We found people who already cared and were already passionate about tea, right? Tea Master of Taiwan, Ambassador of Taiwan, and we got them to show up. 
and then the university didn't have much of a choice. We then flew in the director of the Korean Global Scholarship Fund, the director, uh, the, the tea master of Korea, uh, and, um, and Brother Anthony of the Taizé community, right? Another group of, of fairly high government officials, uh, government-sponsored officials um, from Korea. We did the same thing again, right? So that's how we went about it. We found the people. We made the argument to the people who were passionate and cared about, and then we made a different argument to the university. So these skills are infinitely transferable, right? Being able to recruit people, students like you, to care about tea is not the easiest thing to start with, right? Otherwise, you would all be members of the Tea Institute. Uh, doing that um, with three sides, right? Students, foreign relations, and the university is even more complicated. And you have to give a different argument, a different communication, a different pitch to each of them. Um, and these skills transfer even further. Uh, this is Jerry Schweitzer. He's one of the co-founders of Leblanc, um, the first Brazilian rum uh, in the United States. And we're given a, a big radio show uh, on the failure of innovation in the food and beverage industry. It's a really popularly attended show. Right? Being able to get on the radio where you have no real feedback, where it's just a conversation between two people and have people listen in. It's the same set of skills that we're talking about. So um, first principles. There's a common saying, right? Practice makes perfect. Um, but that's not true, because you're going to do exactly the, you're going to perform exactly the way that you practice. So if you're not practicing perfect, you're not going to perform perfect. So it's really it's repeat and focus. Perfect practice makes perfect, and that means that you go, you're going to need feedback. So the difference between a novice and an expert is a novice looks for positive feedback, right? They want to know what did I do well, right? What was good about this presentation? What was good about the idea. What did you like about it? How likely do you think it's going to be successful? They're looking for that positive push forward, right? That push that tells them to keep going. Uh, experts don't do that, right? Experts do the opposite. They want constructive negative feedback every time. What, did, what didn't you like? What didn't land? What didn't go well? What could have been better? How could we have rephrased this? How could we have repitched this? What example could we have used, right? That's how you know whether you're on the, si on, on the novice side or on the expert side, is when you begin looking for constructive negative feedback. And so we have to get to the point, and maybe we'll get to that today, where we, get, we give everyone constructive negative feedback on their ability to present. So we're going to start the workshop side of things. We're going to start with a game called I Disagree. Um, everyone should take like, less than five to 10 seconds to do this. Um, we're going to go down the row. This is a frequent exercise in debate teams. Right? So I'm going to make a statement, and we'll, we'll limit it to this table first, and we'll do different statements for these tables. And I'm going to make a statement, and you have to say, I disagree and make a single point, OK? So the first statement we're going to make, we'll, we'll go with the same one from the last class, uh, is that all men should grow beards. I disagree. You waste money. H how does growing a beard waste money? <laughs> you have to buy blades and shaving butters and like, spend time in the morning. And maybe you don't catch the bus to class. You have to get, take an Uber. <laughs> I disagree. They're too scratchy. They're too scratchy. Yeah. I disagree. Uh, some people can't rock it. Some people cannot rock it. Um, I disagree because sometimes required for jobs are required for not having for jobs. Required <laughs> being say on the cover of on the screen for the I disagree because sometimes teams just don't belong. I disagree because all men are not worth trying for. I disagree because I can't grow a beer. <laughs> I disagree because I also have trouble growing a beer. You're supposed to be arguing for beers. Yes, no, yes, no. Yeah. It with him. So we're going to do a clarification. You're responding to the person who goes before you. And the other clarification is that you have to make a unique point. So it can't be something that someone else said. OK? 
Uh, so the uh, next one, this statement for you guys to debate, is that we should breed giant dragonflies and create a mounted cavalry for the U.S. Army. <laughs> okay, so she said no, it's expensive. <laughs> Shouldn't our enemies be scared of our flying <laughs> cavalry? Well, won't the mounted cavalry keep you safe? I thought that was, that's what I was arguing. Oh, good. Excellent. You're arguing for the dragonflies. Okay. <laughs> uh, I disagree because I think that they're all for the I disagree because I think that they're all for At least the first time. I disagree because I think drones are cheaper and you can control. Mm. But they don't self replicate. Okay. Um I disagree that drones too expensive. Um I disagree because I think it's just cool. <laughs> Great. Um so this this was better. Everyone's starting to make good points. So final table, you guys have the hardest task. It has to be a, a point. It cannot be an opinion-based argument. Right? So you have to be able to pull some fact. And I, now I need to think of a topic. Um, we should ban self-driving cars. You have to refu re refute her point. He was, uh, yeah, well, he's responding to her that they have been well tested enough. Okay. So I'm going against you. Yes. I disagree that there's a human error in testing. Uh, I disagree that there's a low number of human error in testing. <laughs> Cost more money. Uh, 
technology and art and music to produce music and sell stuff and sell it really bad that's pretty much uh I disagree because it would be able to fire everyone that needs to grab this stuff awesome cool yeah who found that easy one person <laughs> who found that hard yeah so that ability, right, to think on your feet, to be able to immediately respond to what someone said before you, and that's what, that's what this kind of communication exercise is supposed to build. So if you're doing this on a debate team, um, you'd start adding further and further rules. You'd actually have to make uh, specific points to be able to cite certain things. There is cert you can add rules that you have to end on the same topic that you started. Um, so on some of them, we started by talking about self-driving cars should be banned in your first uh, one was that it'll save lives. The entire debate would then have to be on whether or not it saves lives, going back and forth, right? So you can really nail down and practice the ability to go back and forth with someone. And these are the identical skills that you would be doing in, in sales or in recruiting or in pitching investors. So are there any founders here? Anyone wants to start a company? You. Great. Come on up. Come on up. Wait, wait, not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet, yeah. not yet, not yet. You don't know what we're doing yet. <laughs> so we're going to put, what was it, one minute? Yeah, okay, so we're going to put one minute on the clock. Um, you're going to give a, a pitch to the class of why they should invest, join, use it, uh, whichever direction you want to go, uh, and then we're going to do a critique. Constructive negative feedback. It'll be really harsh. Okay, you can start. Okay, so uh, that, uh, we are starting a company like that's based on SaaS project. We have 40 founders in our class. So the project is based about we are building the campus city for female college students. So we are currently sell like pepper spray and all kinds of self defense project. And now we are just getting getting started. We got like a uh, two grand of uh, starting starting money. Is it? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, let's start off with critiques. Anyone have critiques off the bat? Oh. Um, so you didn't really name what your problem was or what like opportunity in the market you were solving for? Yeah, yeah, but what is back to that common thing? <laughs> Other critiques? Why I have to buy from you? Mm, why buy from you versus from any other vendor? Amazon. Critiques? Oh, yeah, go ahead. I spent the whole time talking about what you were doing and what your activity was, never about who you were affecting. Yeah. So, a couple, yeah, a couple of things off the bat. So, you didn't name the company, so we have no way of searching or knowing who you guys are, what you're called. The Quill Company. Quill Company. Quill Second thing is that you didn't really make it impactful, right? The third thing is you actually undermined the pitch by talking about it starting as a class project and 40 other founders, right? You didn't make it sound unique or special. You didn't give a reason why we should believe that you're the right person to do it, right? Um, it sounded like a class idea and well, it wasn't clear if, if you were the only founder, one of many founders, one of a few founders, if the founders were working on the same thing, different things, together, separate, right? Um, so if you were to give that pitch again, you could say something like, um, uh, female safety on campuses is a huge problem. Universities are investing millions of dollars in order to make sure that all of the students and all of the, particularly the female students, feel safe, whether they're dur out during the day, walking around late at night, whether they've had a drink, or whether they're coming from the library. We offer a service that equips female students, funded by the universities, with pepper spray and other defense uh, items that are legal in whatever state we're operating in. We put up phone booths and emergency call booths at various points around campus and make sure that all of the alleyways and all of the walkways are brightly lit. Right? So, yeah. <laughs> that, right? that makes sure that everyone feels safe. It keeps female students on campus. It keeps the campus from being sued. And everyone goes home happy. Right? So that's the type of, of pitch that's, that's unique, that's interesting, and it shows a, a potential business model with partnerships with the university. So, awesome. Thanks. Um, anyone else want to give it a try?
Do 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 do. Where? Come on up. Can you put one minute on the clock? So this app is gonna teach the use uh, to ask for the user what some what is something make them happy every single day, and then we'll upload it to the database and take it to every other user in our community and tell them what make others happy. It's gonna be anonymous and it's all also gonna be very efficient. It will gonna be a sentences, a picture, or um, a simple description of an item. And uh, to build up the community, we are gonna first start inviting. Um, Insta stars or YouTubers to first introduce their influence into our community is, and then we'll build up from that one. And then how, how, are, how are we going to make time? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so uh, critiques off the bat. Yep, didn't say the name of the app. Good, a good opening framing is important, but frames have to be like a sentence or two sentences max, right? You could say something like, um, recently we've seen that everyone's into quantified self and quantified health. What about quantified happiness? Entire countries like Bhutan have in developed something called gross domestic happiness to measure and promote the happiness of their citizenry. We think that we can do better. We can do that from a mobile app and help every individual who wants to be learn what makes them and other users happy, right? That's <laughs> so, so that's like a type of opening frame, right? You're linking it to things that are already happening in the world, things that people already know to be true, and you're saying that you have a solution to an active problem, right? Other, other cr cr critiques, what is, oh, other critiques. Come on, guys, you could do it. Yeah, lead with the impact. Uh, other things, business model. Do you have a business model? <laughs> oh, <geez>. yeah. <laughs> oh. Uh, so my plan is first uh, start um, first starting like um, uh, collecting data from the users, building up the community, show people like how are we going to find things that make people happy, and then we're we're trying to incorporate the shopping. Uh, Shopping, uh, uh, retail therapy. Retail therapy, like, <laughs> of it, and then people can buy directly or purchase yeah. services from our app to achieve their happiness. Awesome, good. So no other feedback? No? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Gotta plug this. Uh, so next thing that we need are Like it went out of presentation mode. That's plenty of time. Where are we? Uh, there we go. Okay, two brave souls. Come on up. We need one other brave soul. Yep, come on up. <laughs> okay, you might want to stand both off to the side. So this is going to be, uh, I'm glad you guys volunteered before you knew what you were volunteering for. That's good. Uh, so um, this is going to be a competition between the two of them. They're going to present. Uh, a company based on slides they've never seen before, 
uh, and whichever one of them presents the better company, we'll, we'll vote on after, okay? So you have two and a half minutes. You're gonna go first. Uh, let's see, this clicker does work, great. Um, you have two and a half minutes. There's going to be six or seven slides. First slide's a title slide. Every slide has, a, has its own title after that, um, and you should present based on that. The, you're gonna be judged on how impactful it is, how realistic it is, and which one we think is more, gonna be more likely to be successful. Ready? Okay, first slide. So, Octavian Legion Inc. This is my company. We are going to attract the market of... <laughs> so, basically the biggest issue right now with soap is that after you clean the dishes, you have soap all over your hands and it has an odd consistency where it like, doesn't really come right off your hands. So what's our solution? <laughs> the proper gloves you wear will actually help keep your hands soapless. Now this is any type of soap, any type of case. As we learned in chemistry class, soaps are faces and they can really hurt your hands. So these proper gloves will actually keep your hands dry and clean and not slippery even after you rinse them off. So, an unfair advantage. Right now the soap industry is huge. Everyone has soap, whether it's dish soap, or hand soap, or like body soap, everyone's got soap, and it's always the same companies, and they dominate the industry. So how do we come up as a new small guy? Well, we're gonna show you where it really helps. We're gonna do it like the European, uh, like tobacco packages, right? Where you just see people with really bad injuries. That's what we're doing with our soap stuff. We're gonna show you what you're super saving it from. Bad skin, pruny fingers, none of that anymore when our gloves are released. And we're going to take an ad campaign that is going to take down this unfair advantage of the soap people who make them make you think that they're saving you from dirt, grime, and unhealth. So when, when does attraction start? Attraction starts when people see the results. When people see that their hands are better off, they're going to know that this is a hit. It's going to take right off. <laughs> so we're going to start off in small retailers with our gloves, and we're going to be giving them dishwashers in restaurants. Those are the people that know the best what it's like to have pretty fingers and soapy hands. So once our gloves really take off within that community and word of mouth takes on, we'll then start an aggressive ad campaign on Facebook and other social media platforms. We want the shares because we want people to share their experiences along with uh, experiences they've heard about as well. So our team. And our app. So the team is me and my friend Davis. Davis is the mastermind and I'm the business mind. All right. He's the one who's been this whole project. Time. Okay. Okay. Wait. Feed feedback. <laughs> feedback. <laughs> Other feedback. <laughs> yeah, pro probably the only feedback is a little bit too much time per slide. Okay. So you got a little bit repetitive with the soap, but other than that, that, that flowed pretty well. No, no, no one else? Our, so, two, yeah, two slides forward. And put the time on the clock. You ready? One more. Go. So my company is called Alex Organic. Uh, so our problem right now is that we don't have enough living space here on the earth, and soon we're going to be depleting our sources. Um, so what we're looking into is being able to move our life source onto another planet. Um, right now, our primary source of life that we're looking into is Mars. Um, we've done a, done a lot of research into the, the living resources there how the environment can work with what we're used to here. So our unfair advantage is that we've actually sent our employees and our testers up onto Mars. Um, <laughs> so right now, we have a habitat up on Mars. It's currently been about a year and a half worth of time. <laughs> so our employees are constantly in contact with us in terms of how they're sustaining life up there. Um, things they're testing, like growing plants, 
um, different life that's already on there. They're exploring, mapping the mapping Mars out, um, which sort of gives us this unfair advantage in terms of other companies that haven't had firsthand experience of being able to be on Mars. So our traction comes when people realize that um, it is a possible source of sustainable life at Mars. Um, we're conducting a lot of different studies right now, gathering a lot of research um, that gives real world results in how this is gonna be an effective solution to the problem of not being able to, to live on Earth for you know, 50 years at a time. Um, so this is our business model. Um, right now there's not any text on there, but we just wanna give a visual image of how our, vis how our business model is gonna work. Um, so right now, I said we mentioned um, we already have people up there, um, and we want to market that somehow to everyone else. So by the next five years, we have a petition of people signing up where they're willing to you know, go out on Mars, and that's a big leap. And I think that gathering enough people, everyone the same as us, um, will sort of show that this is definitely a viable option, and we think that um, that will sort of move and impact everyone else be convinced to take a chance on Mars. So this is <laughs> our team and our Adam. So our team is comprised of three people, uh, myself, Christian Fonaboa, and Ryan Jones. Um, so I'm the salesperson. We have our hacker and we have our designer. Awesome. <laughs> All right, feedback. Feedback. Yes. Atlas Organic. Yeah. <laughs> I believe, right? Yep. That's oh, sweet. Got it. Great picture. Other feedback. So in the beginning, you probably rushed through the problem slide, okay. right? You really quickly went from problem to solution um, without really establishing a firm set of problem. And so much so that you had to go back after presenting the solution and restate the problem. Okay. It was definitely because you were pitching on the fly. Yeah. Uh, but you definitely want to frame it where you go problem, solution, tech, business, traction, right? Onward. Because um, if you have to jump back and forth, break your own flow, you break everyone else's memory. Yeah, okay. exactly. Gotcha. Other things. You're all going to move to Mars based on this pitch. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, we have two, two competitors. Um, we'll do a vote by hands, by voice. Gloves or Mars? Come on. Yeah, gloves, gloves, are, gloves are Mars. Uh, we'll, we'll do it by clap. So for everyone for gloves. <laughs> and for Mars. <laughs> That's pretty close. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah, thank you guys for participating. So, qu qu questions. This is questions for me. A lot of failed pitches. Because remember all those uh, those no investment emails in the beginning? Yeah. Do you have like, uh, I don't know, for, for us, do you have any recommendations for us to, like, instead of having failed pitches, is there other way we can learn? Um, there's not much of a replacement for experience than experience. So you are definitely going to have to get out there and do a bunch of uh, pitches that go poorly or don't go as well as you'd like. Um, you know, one of the, there's a, a funny bit of it. They, they brought in, what's that guy's name? Jerry Seinfeld to teach a class on comedy um, into a, like a comedy school course. And he's like, look, you know, you guys need to know that probably none of you are ever going to be famous. And everyone's like, what? what? You're like, you're taking a comedy course. No one I know who's a famous comedian ever took a comedy course. Right? You, you guys would be better served by going and getting a day job, doing comedy for fun, right? Enjoy it. Um, and so the idea is that Jerry Seinfeld and all of the other uh, comedians, anyone who's spending time like that, is doing it by failing. 
even when when uh, Seinfeld or Stephen Colbert or Jay Leno, any of those guys, are practicing out jokes before the live recording, they're actually practicing it on the tours. As people come through, one of the stops on the tours is actually Jay Leno saying a joke, right? And he measures just intuitively how much they laugh. And if they laugh enough, then it goes on the show. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't laugh enough, then they pass, right? All, even in, in New York City, any of the famous comedians like Dave Chappelle and stuff, you can see them sometimes. They show up at the small comedy clubs and they test out their new material there. They test it out where it doesn't matter, where it's okay if they're not so funny or if it falls flat. So there's not a ton of replacement for that. I would suggest watching back to acts like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates presenting. Steve Jobs is by far the better communicator. Uh, and, and seeing those like, like, like presentations versus presentations at that level back to back uh, is pretty helpful. Other questions? No other questions. Yeah, I don't do the designs, so I make these in the car on the way over. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I do more of, uh, in the company, I run the machine learning, the artificial intelligence. Exactly. Uh, and then I also do all of the client-facing works, the initial client pitches, the contract negotiations and stuff. Um, that won't be the case forever, uh, but that, that's how the work is split up right now. Yeah, yes, we do, do have a very competitive internship program in basically all fields, particularly data science uh, and software engineering. Can you give a founder's pitch for exactly that? Yes, I could. Um, how much time do we have? I have four minutes. This is a fun one. Do um, you want to put uh, two minutes on the timer? Let's see. I'll do a very short version. Um, yeah, I guess you could. Oh, it is being recorded. Awesome. Hi, everyone. I'm Jason Jason, founder and CEO of Analytical Flavor Systems. We built a machine learning and artificial intelligence platform that understands what different people taste in food and beverage products. And because we understand what they taste, we can predict what they like today and predict the evolution of their preferences over time. So we have the largest food and beverage companies in the world develop new products to meet changing consumer preference and to optimize their existing brands. The problem is that 95% of new food and beverage products fail. That's through conception, through R&D for its first three years on the market. That means that the food and beverage industry, out of a $20 million a year spend on new product development and innovation, would be $16.1 billion of that. That's a huge amount of waste. So the problem is that sensory science looks like this, right? You have a couple different people in the room tasting a narrow range of products, writing their notes down on paper and pencil, and what really drives me up the walls are eating pretzels as they do it. This is not a scientific way to develop products. So what we do is we are able to understand and predict different consumers like and dislike products and optimize those flavors, aromas, and textures to meet their preferences so that everyone can have a perfect product that's built for them. We do this in three different ways. We do innovation management, which is new product development, product reformulation, and uh, portfolio management, which is multiple product optimization. Deep market insights, which is cognitive marketing. That's the ability to communicate your flavor profile to your market demographics with the time, focus on the most positive attributes, which causes them to like it more. And we do this by modeling the differences between perception and preference. So across every age, sex, race, socioeconomic status, and consumer cohort, predicting what they're going to like and dislike and how their preferences are going to change. Um, that's probably time. Yeah, 25 seconds. Oh. Um, yeah. No, the rest of this is technology. So that's not enough time. So that would be like a, a pretty quick intro pitch. So that would be too much for an elevator pitch but probably about enough to get someone who is like a VP of innovation or a CTO at a food and beverage company interested. <laughs> Uh, it's a SaaS service. So uh, we take their sensory data, we take what, what their professional tasters in-house on their R&D teams taste, uh, and then we can predict how different consumer cohorts will like or if there's any gaps in their product portfolio. I think we have one more question. No? All right, I'll ask you guys. Was this helpful? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, everyone.
so I guess we could.